Okay. Hi guys. I am doing this live to demonstrate finishing cuts on this spoon that I happen to be making. Which is a walnut serving spoon. It's unusual for me to be carving walnut, but I uh, had to make one for somebody and this piece was on the top of the stack of wood to be made into blanks and it's kind of calling out. So it's going to be really cool because I've got this walnut in the back. So when I dig down into it, that'll become um, visible. Oh, and that was, hold on, I got to take some pumpkin pudding out of the oven. Show it off a little bit. Voila. Good. Okay. So, um, so while I normally carve exclusively um, cherry for orders, I was just feeling a little feisty and really wanted to see what this piece would look like. So. Rather than put it in a box of blanks for somebody else, I decided to carve it for myself. So, um, I'm gonna start describing what I'm doing as I as I do finishing cuts. But before I get to that point of doing finishing cuts, anyone have any questions? Um, as to anything leading up to this point before I start geeking out about finishing cuts here. So, um, let's see here. So at this stage, you can see I've got the outline done, everything squared up and true the way I want it. And um, you can see everything's lined up that way as well. So now, um, this is my last chance, well not actually my last chance, one of my last chance, I want to sort of get the curvature of this rim exactly right and then I'm going to pull it up on the back. Because serving spoons in my mind benefit from having thinner rims, I'm going to go fairly thin here, but either way I'm going to sort of get the rim as thin as I want it, but not worry about blending it too much on the back. That's going to happen after I've done the um, done the inside of the bowl because the curvature of the back is going to respond to the curvature that I create inside the bowl. So now what I'm doing is just just at the edge, not further out from the edge. I'm just there we go. Getting the rim all the way around to be the thickness that I want. You can see that rim thickness nice and even and thin all the way around. Um, just checking, haven't missed anything. No, okay, good. Okay, so now, so now I like to do whatever chamfers I'm gonna do on the handle before I work on the bowl, just so that I don't go back to it. There's no reason for doing this, except that I find that if I leave the chamfers for the end, then I tend to dither about them more and they take longer because I'm sort of going back and forth, back and forth. And so by doing them now, I don't know, I tend to just sort of do them and then I'm done and I don't go back and revisit them. And that really speeds up the process. Um, speaking of which, I had a really good episode on my podcast the other day about speed and how to build more speed into your spoon carving process. One of the things I mentioned was what I just described with sort of figuring out how to stop yourself from going back and forth and back and forth in a scenario. Um, thank you. So you can see how I'm bracing the knife against my chest and pulling out like this. That's a useful tip. And then I do those initial chamfers wide enough that I can come in here with chamfers on either side, and I haven't completely I 
haven't completely eliminated that chamfer. So you can see how I'm having to go back and forth a little bit on the handle here in two directions. That's a sign that I haven't tilted the spoon enough within the um, within the grain of the billet of wood, but uh, I probably didn't because I just didn't have much room to work with. So I imagine this was just as, as tilted as I could make it because otherwise I would have made it tilted enough that I could just carve these chamfers going in one direction without having to go back and forth like this. That's okay. I'm not a big deal. So this walnut, I um, I anticipated it being a little hard to work. So I actually uh, bagged it up after I had carved it. So now you can see, got here. Uh, correct, the back of my bowl is not to the finished. I mean, it's it's close, but it's not it's going to get a final smoothing once I do the inside of the bowl, Rachel. Um, so, anticipating that this walnut might be a little tricky to work, I bagged it up and stuck it on top of a radiator in my house overnight with a couple hats on top of it to sort of hold in the heat so that it had a, plenty of moisture in it. So I wanted it to sort of steam and mellow. And... So far, it seems like it has helped a little bit. Not a, not a crazy amount, not a ton. Um, does that mean that I have to revisit the bowl into the handle chamfers once I've done the bowl back of the bowl? Yes, but by keeping the chamfer simple, it's it's pretty easy thing to blend that in. But that's an important thing to do, anyways. I find because once you've, you know, basically everything about how nice the spoon feels stems from how whether the bowl is exactly right or not. And so if I get that exactly right, it's worth the cost of having to um, sort of blend this back in. Now there's not much there, so I don't, I don't anticipate I'm gonna have to do much. Um, I'm just used to cherry, that's true. I am used to cherry, that is a very true fact. So now, let's see I'm running these Simple facets down, and where they come to this bump down here, what I want is if I do it just right and pay attention as I'm reaching that bump down, I can get the bump down to have this lovely sort of semi-circular look. I'm gonna make a fresh cut to eliminate. Walnut does this thing where, I guess it's reacting with the iron of the knife. It, it makes these purple streaks, so um, it's useful to come back and do it. But you see I'm using just the tip and I'm blending, blending, blending. And what I'm looking for is for the whole thing to end up with this rounded thing going on right there, right? Um, and that's just something that I, I look for and I, I, I shoot for because I like it. Okay, now the handle has a nice overall oval cross section, which is my favorite. Don't be distracted by this. That's There's actually enough there. Um, the solar transition to the handle, where you seem to go back and forth a bit with chamfers. Um, Rachel, do you mean uh, right here, the top of the rim, or do you mean here? Those are two separate things, right? So was it the first one or the second one? All right, so now, this is good enough. I'm going to have one more opportunity to address the top of the chamfer here to get a sweeter thing at the top. So I'm not going to be concerned about that. I am going to trim up the back here. Now with walnut, I've been stropping. I stropped halfway through. And that was important for getting me the, the quality of finish that would allow me to make these as finishing cuts. Um, so even though there's a bit of moisture in the wood, and even though my knife edge was uh, not ideal after roughing out the spoon, um, stropping with both the suede and the smooth leather allowed me to have clean enough cuts for finishing cuts here. Okay. Pros and cons of carving a sapwood heavy piece. Contrast aside. Hi, Daniel. Um, shoulders at the back. Oh, back here. 
Yeah, okay, we'll get to that. Um, so, I'm not sure there are any pros, honestly. You're right that the only reason I'm doing this is for the contrast it's going to provide. Um, so, in, in many ways, this is going strictly against the advice I just gave in my podcast, um, the episode about aesthetics where I talk about how you shouldn't chase contrast and grain because that's going to fade over time. Now, I think with walnut, the contrast is so great that you're still going to see it, so that's why I'm chasing it, but um, I'm just getting out my hook knife. Uh, but really, there are no pros. Basically, it's just a pain in the neck. Um, and you shouldn't go out of your way to seek it unless you really, uh, want to. Um, so I'm just gonna give my hook knife a quick strop before I start on this walnut to get it as sharp as it can be. Um, uh, yeah, generally, I mean, the problem with sapwood is that it has so much moisture that it's gonna warp a little bit more. And it's gonna, it's gonna, it's not gonna take as clean a cut. And um, if you're like me and you carve it anyways to finish without letting it dry, there will in sapwood be. I know, in, I'm not sure what walnut's gonna do, but I know in. Um, don't do that at home, folks. Always use a rag. Um, yeah, the sapwood will stain and darken. Um, but I know that. Uh, with cherry sapwood, for instance, when I um, when I carve a spoon with lots of cherry sapwood and then I wax it right after I'm done, if there's still moisture in that sapwood, which there almost always is, uh, it develops a oh, I should flip this over. It develops a sort of pink blush over a couple of days once it's been, and I think it's like sap being trapped by the wax on the surface, and then the blush fades and it goes back to looking exactly the way it was. So um, I don't know what walnut will do, but you know, you sort of get that, it's not unpleasant, the discoloration, it's not extreme, but it just, you know, sort of clearly looks like there's some moisture being resolved within the piece of wood and it will go away. Um, but that's something to consider with with um, that scenario. What did I do with the cover? Ah, uh -huh. I'm very clever. Um, okay. So now I consider, I consider hook knife um, work to be finishing cuts essentially, because to my mind they happen only as part of the finishing process. Um, now I carve my spoons from start to finish. So if, if I was going to rough out a spoon and let it sit, I definitely do some roughing out hook knife work, but because I basically seamlessly transition from roughing out to, um, to finishing cuts in the bowl, I, I kind of lump them all together as one. All right. So I always do one side of the bowl, you notice how it's choppy and stopped there. And I flip it around and I come in from this side this way. Um, I'm planning with a spoon I'm gonna be carving later today on doing a bunch of one minute videos on Instagram, sort of describing each of these steps. So you can watch here or you can, hopefully if I do them, you'll, you'll uh, be able to find them there as well. Now, Notice how as I get back towards the shoulder here, I'm swirling the knife around to exit cleanly across the grain and that allows me to really clean up this back portion. And notice how I've stayed away from the edge, right? Nice chunky fat edge. Um, what's to make my hook is a matte white um, Temple Mountain Woodcraft Monadnock hook. So, um, so now that I have this initial depth, I'm gonna start working my way out and down at the same time. And as I start shifting away from cuts that rely on opening and closing my hand to cuts that rely on moving the spoon and holding the knife still essentially, it's going to get a lot easier on my body. So um, 
being, you know, those open and shut hand motions are, are tough on your body. And it's worth paying attention to how you can transition after you get those initial hollowing to cuts that are going to be easier on your body because otherwise your hand will start cramping up pretty quick here. So the, the best way to get into this shoulder here is to just use the curvature of the knife and go straight down and then exit across. So that's, you can't really see it because I'm using these fingers to sort of hold everything stable, but that's what I'm doing there. Um, and you can see how I'm going down and then across like that. So, yeah. Now, one of the reasons it's that I shy away from this sort of grain is once this grain shows up, it gets really hard to see if you're symmetrical. So it's worth paying attention to symmetry before you get to this point where the grain is starting to really distract you. And I find with spoons that have less grain, it's just easier to see if you're symmetrical or not. Um, so this is doing exactly what I knew it would do and which is why I wanted to carve the spoon in the first place, which is, you know, as much as I like carving cherry and focusing on the form, sometimes I am a sucker for a nice bit of grain. Um, so I'm going to continue swirling my way out and down. I don't want to let the rim get too narrow before I've gotten down towards closer to my finished depth. Um, and with this walnut, the sort of heavier hogging out cuts need to be supported cuts, meaning like this cut here where I'm locking down my thumb with my other thumb or this cut here where I was coming in towards my thumb. Those are strong cuts. Whereas some other cuts like this where, I, where I, well, I guess I could lock my hand down, but it's just more open, you see? Those cuts are harder to do with a wood that's harder like walnut because you just have less control over exactly where they go or like a cut like this. You just have to be more delicate with them because it's harder to predict exactly where the knife is gonna gonna land. So working my way around. Notice how in the back here I can go straight across this way and kind of swirl just a shade down this way because that's downhill but then there's a spot that the bottom of the bowl is right here and so the grain transition is right there and I need to start coming in from this direction. But right here is a dangerous spot in the rim because you could go too far from one direction or the other and cut way down into the rim and end up having to go um, really change the curvature of your rim. So that's why it's useful to come in like this right there because it prevents you from going too far in that spot where it's real easy to go too far. Um, so by always doing it that way, you make it so that you're just less prone to making that that deserve one disastrous move that changes the shape that you were shooting for or the shape that's possible. All right, so now I'm almost to the point where I'm gonna sweeten up the rim one last time. What I'm looking for is just to have a relatively narrow rim all the way around. Um, you've gone too far there, it sucks. Yeah, exactly, so that's, and that's because, and for whatever reason, this side is easy to not do that on. It's always one side that always has that problem. And it has to do with which side your hook knife is able to come in from. Um, so now that I'm at that point, you see how my rim kind of sticks up here and here? There's these points here. Um, because this rim is angled. And so what I want to do, and you can also just kind of see the rim. You can see the edge of the rim there. So what I want to do is carve the rim as though it were instead of being a plane angled out like this I want to carve it so that it's flat across like that. Now the trick is when you're carving this like that you want to watch the back of the blade because it's going to try and nip in right there so you want to hold it at a high enough angle that it can't. There's a balance between holding it at a high enough angle that it's not going to cut back here but as low as you can go. 
and that's really the best way I can describe it. And what I'm shooting for is to make this curvature as nice as I can make it here. You can see that top curvature. Um, and rather than try and get that right like this, I'm gonna come in here with a hand squeeze cut because I have much more control over when I stop with a hand squeeze cut. Okay. I'll just make sure that that really works nicely. Sometimes you have to come down in this direction. It just depends on how steeply the spoon is tilted within the grain. Either way, you're looking for there to be no bumps in your curve that you have created. Like that. See how that's a nice sweet curve all the way around? All right, so now the other side. Again, it can cut here if you're not careful. So you wanna go as shallow as you can. And notice that I'm using just the tip but you want to watch the back of the blade and make sure it's not biting in there. So the trick is to get it to be heavier on the inside and lighter on the outside. So it just comes up to the line on the outside without changing it, unless you need to change it. You can see how this has a bit of a lump there, right? So. Um, and then I want to just check it side by side and make sure that particularly back here on the shoulders that I'm creating a nice curve as seen from this angle. You see how that's nicer than that, this side, nicer than that side. Um, a nice flat tip. It's easy to have the tip have a bit of a lump there, um, but I don't want that. So. In general, you get better, smoother lines when you make one sort of confident cut than if you were to make a million small cuts. Um, no matter how careful your small cuts are, you get a nicer line with a confident cut. Okay, now, Uh, I'm just gonna get just a smidge more. Okay, so now the last thing I'm gonna do is redefine this little bump down thing here with just a little thumb push. And what I want is to blend it in so that the um Essentially what I'm creating is defining the inner rim that I'm gonna cut up to. And I'll show you what I mean in just a second here. Just gotta do it first. And I'm gonna, if I mess up the nice curvature at the top, I'm just gonna take a second and reestablish that. So what I want in this particular design is to have this little chamfer that's running around the outside of the rim, then flow into here, and it's gonna be this tiny little sub angle, and that's gonna show me how far I'm gonna go with hook knife. Um, yeah, yeah, Chuck, it, it makes a difference. On the other hand, you can go too far with a confident cut, so it's it all depends. All right, so now I've done everything there. I've got a nice flow. I've reestablished my rim. Now it's time to go and pull the rim in tighter on the inside. All right, always sheathe your tools. So now, ignoring what's happening in the center, I'm gonna essentially work my way around the rim and get the rim exactly how I want it, exactly the width that I want it. Now I found that a rim that changes thickness is easier to get looking good than a rim that where you're trying to shoot for the exact same thickness all the way around. And that has nothing to do with aesthetics, it just has to do with the fact that if you're trying to get the exact same thickness all the way around, 
any mistake anywhere and you're, you're then adjusting everywhere. Whereas if the rim thickness is changing, in my case, I always make it narrower on the sides and thicker at the tip so that it has a little more robustness to it. As long as the rim is changing, then if there's a little spot where I've gone too far, I just blend it in. And all of a sudden it becomes very easy to get a really nice looking rim when you step back away from the idea of it having to be the same width all the way around. You can see that I'm not even messing with the um, the curvature on the inside of the bowl at all. And instead, just doing these thin, delicate little cuts right at the rim. And that's really the key, is that If I were to try and make like a powerful cut across the bottom of the bowl and have the rim end up exactly how I wanted it, I would probably get one but not the other of those two things. And so simply acknowledging that fact and separating the two functions means that I can get the rim exactly how I want it. Right now the rim is a little, little fat up there, nicely tapered all the way around just like that. And now I can blend in the bottom. And for these blending cuts, I tend to go with the grain. So you can see I'm starting at the tip, working my way down. Um, and that's just because for whatever reason, they blend in and are less noticeable, both in your mouth if you're doing an eater, but also they're just less noticeable to your fingers if you're doing it this way. And what I'm searching for is to get a nice, even curve across. So I'm going sort of up to the rim, but not actually touching it. It's stopping a fraction of a millimeter away so that I'm not trying to recut that rim. And then I'm not trying to do any specific number of cuts. I'm, I'm just focused on how it feels from side to side. Um, yeah, this is walnut. Um, and this piece is, at this point, it's fairly dry. I do think that the um, steaming it with its own sap overnight was um, on the radiator was it was a good move because it um, well, I have something to say about the back here it's important to get the back deep enough and it's also important to get this front bit deep enough so um, with the back you can almost always swirl across the back like this but then there's always that one quadrant that needs to be got at from the other the other piece so I think that the steaming really helped, and you want to pay attention to where that rim is, make sure you're defining it correctly with the hook knife as you do this, not going past where you want to go. Um, the steaming really helped because it's remarkably dry, and even the sapwood has lost a ton of moisture. Um, all right, so now, This is the trickiest part of pretty much any spoon is blending, right? You've dealt with that back quadrant, but now you need to blend it into the front bit. And that's easy to do on one side of the bowl. And for what, you know, for reasons of sort of using a hook knife, it's, it's trickier to do on the other side of the bowl. Um, So you see how there's these little ridges right here. Can I talk through the swivelly cut again? Yeah, so I'm about to do them. Great. So, um, ooh, and right at this stage where I'm trying to get my final cuts, I'm going to stop and I'm going to strop again because I found that that makes a big difference. And because it's still feeling nice and sharp, I'm just going to do the, um, the smooth leather. And I'm going to do a bunch of passes, though. You can see how fast these passes can be because this inner rail system is so good at self-leveling and because the whole thing can wiggle on the block just a little bit. I just cut mine. <laughs> That'll learn me. Okay. I'll just do a little bit. 
bit on the outside. Okay. So now I've got a freshly sharp hook because this is the final layer of stuff I'm going to be doing with a hook knife. So it's worth getting a fresh cut. And I have this sort of final depth that I want to remove here to get a nice blend from the front to the back. So I'm going to go down and then just sort of pivot my hand down and that'll pivot the knife around. Um, and you can actually see the difference in the quality of cuts. That's this newly stropped cut. Now, obviously, there's some moisture changes that you're seeing there as well, but I can feel the difference in how smooth it is. So I'm coming down, and then sometimes, depending on how forgiving the grain is, you can just pop out this way, but sometimes, if it's, if it's not wanting to exit, you can exit by sort of swirling the whole spoon around, and that pivots the knife like this. Um, Now, it's possible to overdo it by going back and forth and back and forth a million times, like I just did there. Because um, then you have to, if you pivot too far on the back here, then you find yourself sort of in the same sort of changing this up. So the trick is really this bit right here where you can't pivot across. How do you do that? Well, I find I do it best if I use the cross thumbs grip, which helps me stop. And then I just come in. And I kind of nibble my way down from the top so that I'm not coming in from a long cut trying to get it to stop when I want it to. Yeah, the rotation helps me exit the cut. And then once I've basically gotten it smoothed out, I then take my final smoothing cuts. And because I'm not diving into a mountain at the, at the end there, it's easy to sort of stop before it starts going uphill again. And that cross thumbs grip also really helps me to stop. Just like that. Good. And then if I'm having trouble, I can do sort of a smaller version of that pivot cut where I go in and then I just exit in a very small sort of way across the grain. Um, but this area is always going to have, it, you know, it's rare for me to get a spoon that's like, perfectly smooth. This is partly why um, scoops appear to be so smooth is that scoops don't have this same issue. Scoops are just going around and around and around. Whereas with here, you do have that, that bit of an issue. All right, that's about as clean as I'm going to make the bowl. And now I'm going to do finishing cuts on the rim and on the back of the bowl. So finishing cuts on the rim, there's, oh, I'm going to do my inner rim cut with the hook knife, like so. You, I used to use the tip of the Sloyd knife, and then I realized that I was endangering, with every cut, I was like, if I went too far, I was going to dig the tip of the Sloyd knife into the spoon bowl, and I realized I had the perfect knife to do this. That's already curved, so that it never does that. So I'm just taking the tiniest little cut. that. Particularly for eaters, that's really helpful for making it feel nice and smooth. Um, I just felt a spot where one more pass would make it just that more smooth. There we go. Yeah, good. Okay, now onto the rim cut. I do that same pivot on the other side, but swirling the opposite way. It doesn't work as easily to to pivot towards the tip of the hook knife chuck as it does to pivot on the tip and pivot the back end around. It just doesn't, you don't have as much leverage and it would it requires a, a bit of force. Um, to handle up at 12 o'clock, no. Essentially what you're asking is, can I do the cut that I do, which is where you come in at thing and come across. Um, because it doesn't, there's not enough grain going this direction for that to really work out. 
Now, as this dries more fully, you can I can see one little spot that's slightly imperfect right there. I'm just going to leave it because this is a classic example of where you try, you know, you go back to try and fix that. I mean, this bowl is practically flawless. I go back and try and fix that, and all of a sudden, I've opened a whole can of worms. That's going to basically disappear with burnishing. So now I'm going to do rim cuts. So my rim right now is like this, and I'm going to do the tiny, and I've done a little micro chamfer on the inside. I'm going to do a little micro chamfer on the outside. But before I do that, I need to look at it from here, and any spots that make sense to, to just knock any little bumps off, I'm going to do that. Um, my hook knife does not cut both ways. It's only on one side. Um, so um, what I'm expressly not trying to do is recut the rim entirely. I do not want to recut the rim entirely. All I want to do is look for spots where there are little bumps in the rim, like right here, and just shave down those bumps. Notice how small that is. It's such a small motion. I'm not trying to recut the rim. Can I have I said that clearly enough, people? Um, I'm just smoothing out areas where there are bumps. I'm not trying to recut the rim. If you try and recut the rim, you're gonna shoot yourself in the foot here. Don't do it. Um, Okay, that just makes a big difference in how how it feels. All right, so now I'm gonna do. <laughs> so now I'm gonna take off this little tiny micro chamfer here, and with this one, it's really important that your knife is tilted down far enough. If your knife is too shallow like this, you're too much in the plane in this plane, and and you're going to dig into the wood and crack it going forward. So instead, your knife has to be like this, which puts you into this plane, which it's happy to cut from there up to the tip. So watch the angle of your knife as you make this little micro cut here, because it would be a shame to really crack the, the now relatively delicate rim of your spoon at this stage just because you didn't pay attention to that. So again, keeping my knife so then I'm essentially carving it in this in this orientation. Um, so just like that. And notice how small that is. It's so small that you basically can't see it, right? It's like super tiny. And yet it makes a big difference. Both in how it feels and in how durable it is. Because that super sharp edge is delicate because of its sharpness and prone to damage. So right in here at the neck you have to be very careful not to dig in. So notice how I'm twisting out of each cut and I'm careful not to open a can of worms. Same deal. And it's such a small cut, just like that. Good. Now, I've got the top exactly how I want it, the handles exactly how I want it. Um, thanks, yeah, I turned, I rotated my chair 90 degrees, so I've got the sunlight coming right in here. Um, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to smooth out the back of the bowl. Um, and this spoon has a relatively shallow uh, keel right there's not not much keel there and that just that's an artifact of the, the piece of wood that I was carving or that I had at the beginning um, that's fine it's plenty strong um, so now I'm just going to do a series of blending cuts and these are sort of thumb pushes that sometimes extend with a, a pivot at the end um, and they're sort of layered one on top of the other to get a blended effect um, and by not trying to get sort of precise, even number of facets, it allows me to focus on, did I get the curvature right? And it allows me to easily adjust it without having to go back and adjust all the facets to make it work out evenly. 
Um, and notice that I'm getting up to, but not messing with this rim underneath. Um, so I'm getting up to it, but I'm not trying to re cut it. I got it as thin as I wanted it earlier than this process. So now it's sort of the outside's equivalent of when I blended the inside of the rim and I sort of went right up to that rim, but I didn't actually try and redefine it in any way. Um, and it might feel like you're not making a lot of progress and then all of a sudden you'll realize that the area where you've been working is much smoother. The way that this sort of blending works is it feels like it's yeah, this is Sherry disguised as walnut. Um, uh, the way this works is that it's you're sort of knocking off corners and knocking off corners, and it doesn't feel like it's making difference. Doesn't feel like it's making difference, and all of a sudden you're like, "Holy cow! Like this is really smooth compared to this other spot that's jagged over here." So um, just stick with it. It will happen. It's just a. It's sort of one of these things where it compounds. And notice how I'm using my fingers as calipers to tell me where things are a little too thick. If this were an eating spoon, I'd be putting it in my mouth to tell where things are too thick. Um, but you have to you have to use your fingers or your mouth or something to tell you, because just going by eye is not going to tell you the crucial thing, which is how does it feel. And on things like scoops, this can be a real pain in the neck. I don't know if any of you guys watched my ladle video, but that this part of the process for the ladle took a long time. For a, a spoon like this, it's um, it's just not it doesn't take very long. All right, Rachel, if you're still watching, this is so now I'm gonna go back and uh, do the back shoulders. Now with the back shoulders, actually the rim does need to be defined a little bit better. You can see it's just a little fat compared to up here, right? And so the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to define that rim. Now one side is going to be fairly easy to do that, and the other side is going to want to be a little scallopy. I don't, can't quite articulate why yet, but I think it has to do with the, the way that the, the fat part of the knife keeps wanting to dig in on this side, whereas on the other side, the tip is what's defining the rim, and it it's quite happy to not dig in. So on one side, you can do it quite easily like this. Um, thanks, Chuck. Uh, so yeah, I mean, this is something I struggled with for a long time too. So I think it has to do with the tip here on this side is quite happy to sort of pivot out of it. And so you can define the rim exactly that you want. On this side, because it's still the tip, but it's sort of the, the fatter part is what's defining the rim. There's a tendency to go scallop, scallop, scallop. And so you have to really sort of get right up on the tip and be aware of that tendency. And even then it'll happen a little bit. Now, again, because these are two different cuts, one with the fat part towards the rim and one and the other with the rim towards the rim, they're gonna cut the shoulder back here differently. Um, yeah, which is great. That's what it's, that's what it's for, man, reunions. Um, so, uh, so right here is where you need to just sort of be aware of how much you're cutting and eyeball it often and adjust and adjust and adjust. And notice how I'm making almost all these cuts with just the, the tip of the knife. Um, and what I'm shooting for is when I look at it like this, I want to see sort of even curvature going in and, and sort of even curvature wrapping around. Now, on some of my spoons, it's more defined by planes. You know, on the cooking spatula or the cooking spoon, it has, you know, this rim widens out and becomes the, the side facet of the handle. Whereas on eaters and serving spoons, it's much more about blending this curve wrapping it up towards the rim. So it, so it depends on what you're shooting for. Um, but either way, these back shoulders, it's easy to not work them enough. And then they end up feeling a little lumpy and bumpy compared to the rest of the spoon. At the same time, notice how I'm using the tip of the knife to make sure I'm not over cutting the neck here because that's also easy to do. It's easy to not do enough and it's also just as easy to do too much. Um, 
So I'm eyeballing it. And I'm also feeling for the thickness because um, you don't want the shoulders to feel too thick. The shoulders provide a certain amount of strength for the spoon, so they obviously don't want to be too thin, but I feel like most people err on the side of having their shoulders end up too thick, um, just because this is a pain in the neck to do. So one way you can improve your spoons generally is to just spend a little more time on this step and sort of very thoughtfully blend your cuts so that you get just the right curvature and just the right thickness that matches from side to side. Um, this spoon is for somebody, Chuck. Yeah, it's somebody who ordered a serving spoon and while generally serving all commissioned work is out of cherry, this blank came up yesterday when I was working and I said, I know exactly who this is for. So, okay. Good. Now when I look at it, I can see that everything is good. Um, as far as getting this transition to flow into the handle, at this point you just kind of go along and make sure that your facets all meet up the way you intended for them to. Once you've done that, sometimes I would have to carve down the back of the spine a little bit, but in this case I didn't have much to begin with, so it's just not a big deal. Um, and there we go. This spoon, so I always like to have my spoons be um, fattest in the middle and then tapering out to the edge. Because this middle, you can see, is just a shade higher than I would want it to be, I deliberately left it a little bit fatter here. Um, I show the shoulders and neck up close. So on this type of spoon, I basically want it to be a smooth curve wrapping right up to a nice tight rim like that. Um, but uh, on other types of spoons, it's different. Um, and you can see I got it basically even in how it comes in here. But it's, it's easy to have this sort of lean towards one side or the other, depending on if you're a lefty or a righty. So now, so I'm gonna continue so I can get the actual burnishing and polishing in before I'm done. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna polish you can, uh, I'm sorry, burnish. You can burnish with anything. You burnish with a, your knife handle. If it doesn't have paint on it, you can burnish with a pebble, a pestle, back of a metal spoon, a um, bit of deer antler. Each of those will have, sort of have slightly different qualities in terms of the quality of burnished surface that they leave. Um, I personally prefer the way porcelain feels to deer antler. Um, um, and ironically, I like the way rock, the way stone feels, is actually even better than porcelain. But um, but rocks are hard because you got to sort of pinch them, and it's hard to do the outside. Uh, the purpose of burnishing, for me, is smoothing down all the bumps. And, and just kind of, you don't lose the facets, but you lose any sort of harsh edges that you might have failed to take down. And for me, it's a big step in sort of getting my spoons that extra little bit smooth. Um, so, again, I tend to concentrate my burnishing on the inside of the bowl since the outside is going to get polished with the broom corn polisher as well. And then the other thing I concentrate on with the burnisher is really sort of pushing on that edge. Um, oh, and I totally forgot to do, stand by, the, um, it's not quite like a fine sanding because you're not actually removing any material. So I totally forgot to do the last little micro chamfer on this back rim here. And I should also say, not only is my rim sort of fatter at the tip in this dimension, but I tend to also leave it slightly fatter in this dimension, where it is thinner down here. Um, so very thin 
chamfer. This is important. If you don't do this, then the burnishing doesn't do as good a job. And you can use this last sort of micro chamfer to really sweeten up because what your eye sees is the line between those two points. So you can use this to sweeten up the line that your eye is going to see, even if it sort of creates a bit of a bump to the side. It's just your eye won't notice that little bump. Um, but what it will see is the really nice sweet line. So it's a nice little trick to have up your sleeve. To be a conversation there. Um, uh, I'll, I'll get to the broom polisher in a second. So what this side of the burnisher allows me to do is really apply a fair amount of pressure in towards the rim. And that's really useful. I feel like it helps make my spoons more durable. And you always want to support a spoon when you're burnishing it. You never want to do it out in the air like this. You want to support it because you're really pushing down on it. It both helps you get a nice even pressure and keeps you from applying undue stress to a spoon that might be delicate. This spoon is not delicate, but some spoons are. So it's just a good habit to get into. Good. Now the handle. You can, I mean, I was going to say you can overdo burnishing. What I mean is you can burnish to the point where you no longer really see your facets. So I always try and stop shy of that because I want my facets to still be visible. Um, and now I'm going to actually apply a fair amount of pressure down into this. And one of the things I like doing with the ends of my handles is if I apply a fair amount of pressure and I've done a good job of doing sort of long facets that are this way, I can actually make it look almost like I took sandpaper to it, which I just really like. On the end of the handle, it's kind of an unexpected little tactile pleasure. Um, I am sort of compressing the wood, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Chet. Yeah. It's fun to carve something different every now and then. But I do think this is a good example of what my serving spoons look like these days. A bigger bowl than I do for a cooking spoon, more delicate rim, more delicate neck, and a slightly wider handle, um, and not a lot of crank. You can see it doesn't have a ton of crank to it. Um, all right, let's talk about the polisher for a second. Uh, these are made by Cynthia Main Sunhouse Craft for me, um, and while you can scrub these down on a, on a piece of dried board, and really soften up these fibers and use this in the center. I would not use this in the center the way it arrives from me. It's still harsh and scratchy. Instead, use this center bit here. And because the broom corn has a certain amount of flex to it, it's gonna wrap around the facets and polish in a different way than the burnisher is gonna polish. And it just kinda hits everything with a nice sheen. And I was originally, trying this to see if it would be a good substitute for the burnisher and what I found is it doesn't do quite what the burnisher does but it also it's an excellent complement to the burnisher but the spoons that have both of this happening to it are just sort of on a different level than spoons that had just one or the other um, which was not my intention setting out but it is what it is all right now I'm gonna go over to the stove I'm going to raise this whole thing up. Whoa! That still lets me... Oh, stand by. Stand by. Technical difficulties. There we go. Alright, so... Can you see the burner? You can see the burner. Let's move the pie. Moving the pie. Alright, so this is some beeswax yoyoba oil mixture. Um... Yeah, I like it too. It's not, you know, it's still a nice finished spoon and it still asks that of you. Um, so this beeswax yoba oil mixture is just roughly two parts oil to one part wax by eye. I just, I don't weigh anything. I don't really, I sort of measure it in the can, the coffee can that I do it in. And basically smear this around. The reason I like this is that it's, it doesn't discolor the wood as much as 
linseed oil will, and I like the way it tastes because it doesn't have a taste, and I like the way it smells because it smells like honey, and um, and I like how I can use the spoon immediately after doing this. I used to use linseed oil, but I just found that my customers didn't like it, and I didn't like it, and it was a real turnoff. So I thought, why am I doing this to my my spoons? So it's important to keep it turning. If you don't want singed bits, you don't want to stick it way down in the flame. Particularly if it's got a sharp corner, that'll get singed first. And as it heats up and starts to bubble, you want to... Uh, beginner sometimes it's hard to... Not looking at the burner, look at this pie. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a pumpkin pie I made this morning. Uh, I did not make the crust on that one. That is a crust from the freezer, baby. I was just going to do uh, custard, but... My wife pulled this crust out of the freezer that she bought a while ago and was like, use this up. It needs to get used. Um, but these are the pumpkins that we grow in our garden. So as it, the whole thing heats up and you can, if there's a lot of moisture in it, you can start to see that moisture bubbling out and you want to keep smearing this stuff around. Because if you don't smear this stuff around, then it gets kind of rough where the moisture bubbled out. But if you do give it like nice amount of excess, it gets really smooth again. And I think it just has to do with how the fibers are absorbing the oil. Whew, that's so hot I can barely touch it. Let's do the back here. One of the other nice things about this is that um, the, the spoon itself gets tougher than if I, you didn't do this treatment to it. Um, So I don't tend to bother with the handle quite as much. And bear with me while I grab the rag, which is otherwise known as an old t-shirt. Move the tripod a little bit. All right, so an old t-shirt. And wipe it down and it's ready to be used because the oil and wax mixture has been sucked into the wood and you've buffed off anything remaining on the surface. There is no wait time, there's no dry time. If this was an eating spoon, I'd start using it right away. Um, so, um, that is that. And setting your oven to 150 and letting the spoon warm up and then adding your wax mixture. Yep. Yeah, that's probably a good way for anyone who has electric burners, which don't do this particularly well. You know, experimenting using your oven or a toaster oven. Um, I don't think candles work particularly well because there's a certain amount of soot that comes off the candles. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, you guys should add that to the um, Spoon Carving Collective. I know people have been wanting to know about sort of options for that if you have an electric stove. So that's it. And you can see how, you know, I've got everything lined up and everything nicely blended. And that's it. Thanks for watching, guys.